Welcome to the Jamie Ivey Show. I'm your host, Jamie, and today I'm sitting down with Scott Erickson. He's an artist who says his art is creating a visual vocabulary for our spiritual journey. Scott, welcome to the show today. I'm glad to be here. You know, this is our first time meeting mm -hmm. in real life. In real life. I, I think we meet people on the internet all the time. Yes. But I need you to know, I have two of your paintings in my house framed on my wall. That's amazing. I'm humbled and honored because of that. Does, how it's does great. that make you feel? It's everything I hope for. I mean, I, like I had a conversation with myself as I do as I an like artist. I like that. I know, yeah. Uh, well, when I think you're going through your journey of an artist, you're, you have to figure out what your goals are. And, um, you know, there's a lot of myths or things like you're supposed to do gallery shows or things like that. And I, I had a conversation with myself years ago where I was like, what gives you more joy having like one person own one painting uh, or having a hundred people have like a print of that painting mm -hmm. or something like that? And so, and I said, I would love to equip as many people as I can with art in their homes. And so uh, I kind of figured out how to do that and, and tried to get, like I go over to people's houses and I see nothing on their walls. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I wanna help put stuff on your walls. So that is uh, what I've been trying to do. So um, it's awesome. I'll see. tell you a funny story. Yeah. We took down, well not we, my husband, yeah. took down a family photo of us, me, my husband, our four kids, uh -huh. and replaced it with, your, <laughs> with one of your paintings. And so one of my kids is on a mission to get our family photo back on the wall, but okay. Aaron has replaced it okay. with yours and he's there for, here for it. So, okay. okay, you said when you're having this conversation with yourself, with yeah. yourself which I love, yeah. trying to figure out what is it that you want. Um, I think a lot of us don't do that, but I'm curious because I know you as Scott the Painter, Yep. okay? artist. Mm -hmm. Where did you start out this way? Did you start out your career with painting? Uh, well, I was trained as a high school art teacher. So that was my degree. So I taught high school for a couple years. And I then, did not know this. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 27, uh, I had this moment. And, and at the time I was still, I was painting in an attic. Uh, I had a studio in this attic of a church. And so I was, I had this practice that I was doing which I would say what being an artist is, is you've, you've committed to a practice with a material or mm -hmm. a medium. And so I had this practice, but I was teaching and I had this, I, I, like a moment when I, in one of my prep periods, I was writing on the board and I stopped and I was like, I'm being invited to something else. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I can sense there's something else I'm being invited to. And then it was a long, long, long story, but I went to New York to visit some friends, met a bunch of artists, and on the way back, I was like, if I don't try to be an artist, whatever that means, I don't even know quite what that means, but if I don't try to be an artist, I'll always regret it. And at the time, I was single. I think I was starting to date my wife, but uh, yeah. you know, I didn't have any real commitments besides yeah. uh, just trying to be myself in the world. Yeah. And so I stopped teaching and I kept my job waiting tables and you know, the, the ultimate artist job. And uh, I ended up getting married and my wife has been my sugar mama for a lot of our relationships. <laughs> so that's nice. I like but, her. But uh, I committed to that. And that was around 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah. You know, you said something when you said you had this moment of if I don't do, there's something else I'm being invited to. Yeah. And for you, it was to this career to do art to not be the high school teacher, yeah. to step out and try something else. Yeah. It's not that for me, you know. But <laughs> okay. I think that happens to all of us all the time, but we're scared to, to do that thing. Yeah. Why did you do it and some people don't? I often get asked like, how did you become an artist? And it wasn't just one moment, it was like a series of moments of identifying this thing in me. Um, but on that flight, I actually had a very prayerful moment where I, I sensed the spirit ask me, what do you, tell me what you want to do and I'll bless it. Mm. And, and I, I had four things. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I said, I want to be a full-time artist. I want to work as a, at a church as an artist. Uh, I want to fight evil, meaning I want to, <laughs> I want to be a, a part of things that are important. Yeah. And I want to go on tour with a band and make paintings during shows. Very specific. And within two years. And what years, year was this? Uh, this was 2003. Okay. 2003. Uh-huh. Within two years, all of that happened. 
Um, Did you have any like asterisks of what band you wanted to travel with or was it just, no. I'm gonna leave it open? No, a friend of mine uh, in Seattle, his name's Sean McDonald. He kind of had, he still does music, but he had his kind of moment in the early 2000s yeah. and he was going on a tour and he said, hey, I wanna do this traveling art show. I want somebody to be painting on mm -hmm. stage. Do you wanna come and do that? So I used to do a lot of live painting. Yeah. I still do that. Yeah. Um, and then I started, uh, getting connected with World Vision and doing advocacy work for AIDS orphans yeah. and fundraising by making paintings at yeah. events and uh, auctions and stuff like that. And uh, I eventually got invited by this church to come and they gave me a space in their church and I started like working at the church. I started painting every service. Which I think that is the one when you listed the four yeah. that I was like, that was going out on a limb to me because yeah. that's not a common thing in no. churches. Like, no, hey, let's not. hire an artist. No. and. And usually what that means is like, let's hire an artist. It's like, who's going to do our graphic design? Right. Who's going to do our, you know, screen art uh -huh. and things like that. And I, uh, I, after high school, I spent a year in Europe. Uh, I had a longtime friend. She's my parents' age, but she was always a friend to me. And her name's Mary. And she, my senior year of high school, she was like, what are you doing after high school? And I was like, I don't know, community college, travel. She's like, do you want to come to France and be my assistant with another girl, Cindy, and uh, and just come and live for a year. And I did, and did a lot of admin work yeah. and <laughs> traveled around with her, but uh, we lived three blocks from a cathedral. And I went to that cathedral every day, whether for five minutes or an hour. And it's, it's really now in retrospect that that was so forming to me mm. because I grew up in Protestantism, which yeah. is really void of any visual vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And then to be in a building that the whole thing is designed to communicate the story of God without using words. Yeah. Um, it, it let me know. I felt like I had felt like a stranger my whole life so far in religion. And then I was like, oh, there's a place for me. Wow. And when I came back to the States, there was always this question, which was, well, what is the role of the artist, the visual artist yeah. in the church? Because yeah. uh, I don't think we should make cathedrals anymore because that would cost like a billion dollars. Right. <laughs> but Aren't like, they still building one in Spain? Like yeah, they're still they're working still on building it, yes. the Gaudi one. Yes. And then uh but because I was like the the artist was involved in translating the message the story of God to a illiterate culture. Yeah. But now I think the question is, well how do you translate the story of God to a spiritually illiterate culture? Mm -hmm. And that's where I've kind of found my That's voice. That's where you, I feel like your mm -hmm. voice is right now, yeah. for sure. And you took that journey of feeling that for the first time yeah. after you graduated high school and mm -hmm. spent a year in France. I mean, that in, that seed was in yeah. me for a long time before I even could give language to what was happening. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I uh, how I got to Texas, how I'm in Texas, uh, I worked at a church in Houston called Ecclesia, and I was the artist in residence for three years. And that was kind of the final culmination of that idea of what would an artist do and I and Chris C gave me a really awesome opportunity to he just like listen to the Holy Spirit and do what you think you need to do and I I had really specific goals because when I because I had this question I was like what would an artist do if you had a chance to what would you do and I I was like I don't want an office I want a studio mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to be an arts pastor because frankly they just put on events and have coffee with people right. I was like I want to make work and yeah. I uh, um, and because I could live paint and, and, and felt comfortable mm -hmm. painting and have this translation talent, I made a painting every service, five services a weekend for three years. So I made hundreds a of paintings. A new painting every single yeah, service. Yeah, every single service. And all of those images went out into the city, into the community. Wow. They're still in my friends' homes mm -hmm. or people, strangers I don't even know, yeah. but they would, they got them. And then, and really during that time I developed, um, I, that's where I developed a visual vocabulary, like learning how to translate, because I was basically translating a service, yeah. a sermon every week, uh, every weekend. And how do you, how do you translate forgiveness? Mm -hmm. You know, people are like, a cross. Okay, what else yeah, besides yeah. a cross? <laughs> how do you translate hope? A cross. Yeah. What else okay, besides a cross? Okay, come on, an anchor, an anchor. I'll give you an anchor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, an anchor, yes. yeah. yeah. You know, what? and it turns out there is this, there is a history of um, symbology that is in the Christian tradition and in any kind of religious tradition. And But also I wanted to recontextualize that stuff after a pop culture revolution, mm -hmm. after tat uh, tattoo art, yeah. after... Um, 
graffiti art? Like, what would what are what would it look like now? You know, what would our symbol set be yeah. now? And that that's really a lot of how what I do now is come where that's come from. Well, yeah. I love it. I told you we have our two pieces in our house, and we yeah. love it so much. And I one of the reasons I love it is because you've given space and a voice and. Um, maybe this availability for people who might not have felt like they had a place in the church. Yeah. Because for a long time, the American church has not been too, um, wel not welcoming, but a place for artists. Yeah. Hasn't always felt at home yeah. in the church. And you have kind of yeah. broken that mold a little bit. And I think that a lot of people are saying there is a place for this and it can't, what yeah. you do, the art you create, yeah. it's, it represents the gospel. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think there's some uh, remnants of the Reformation, which was pushing back against this kind of overly bloated Catholic system. Right. There's some really good things in there, but it, when we started getting into indulgences and stuff, it was getting pretty uh, not great. And that's what Martin Luther was pushing against. But uh, they kind of swung the whole other way, which was like, we don't need anything exactly. else except the for The pendulum this. went all the way. Yeah. And what we threw out uh, was that actually imagery can be very spiritually very forming so. to yeah. us. Yeah. Um, and I think I've seen over the last couple decades, this desire, this longing um, to, to, to have, you know, what I would say is like, what the image helps do is it gives an anchor point or a touch point to an experience you have. Yeah. It becomes like a, an artifact. Mm -hmm. I, like the way that I would describe my elevator pitch of my art is I'm giving a visual vocabulary for people's spiritual journeys. Like as we're evolving and forming throughout our lives and we have these deconstruction, reconstruction, mm -hmm. mystical moments, prayerful moments, uh, you know, idea, you know, uh, uh, surprises, you know, experiences, like how, what would I have to like symbolize that? Mm -hmm. What would my Ebenezer be, yeah. you know? What would my, yeah. And so I think though, that's what I found my art does for people mm -hmm. is it goes, I found my story in your art, which, you know, that makes good art. Yeah. It's like, I found my story in your art and I have that up to remind me of yep. that, which yep. which instills faith and grows faith in people. It. And that's overwhelming. I love it. Well, speaking of story, thank you for telling us how you got where you are now. And we're yeah. gonna come back after the break. And we're gonna talk about Say Yes, um, yeah. your new project you're working on now. So come right back with us. Able is an ethical fashion brand that employs and empowers women as a way to end the cycle of poverty. It started with scarves years ago and now it's an entire fashion brand. And I am so grateful that Able has dressed me from head to toe for this Jamie Ivy show. I would love for you to see all my favorites. Go to jamieivy.com slash Able to see everything I'm loving at Able right now. Okay, we're back. Scott Erickson is here with us still. Okay, I've got yeah. to ask you about this. I've mm -hmm. heard about your show, mm -hmm. Say Yes, uh, which love the title, first of all, and it is a liturgy of not giving up on yourself. Yeah. And even from our past conversation, I can see that, I think that you've, I don't know your journey of giving up on yourself, but it seems to me that you've been fighting to not give up on yourself because of where you are. How did this Say Yes journey start for you? Uh, the moment I guess the conversation started happened when I, I was, um, I was about to turn forty. Okay. Uh, and I put my kids to bed one night, and I walked out of their bedroom, and I noticed I was crying. Not because we had had a magical bedtime. This was something else, and I tried to stop, yeah. like we usually do, and I couldn't. And I ended up in our only bathroom in the house, this little tiny bathroom, <laughs> off the kitchen, and I wept on my toilet for. 40 minutes mm. and my wife found me. She's like, what's going on? And I was like, I don't really know. I don't know what's happening to me. And uh, with some time from that moment, I realized what was happening is that a, a dream was dying in me, mm. which happens in middle of your life, which is you come to a point where how you thought your life was gonna turn out or how you thought you would turn out, didn't meet, does, the reality doesn't meet up with the expectation. and. And I really started to understand who I wanted to be in the world. Mm. That was my grief was that I started to figure out like what kind of person I wanted to be. And I wish I knew at 18 because I wish I had those like 20 years back to do it all over again, right. but I didn't. And 
And so then, so, and what that was is I started to understand that I was much more of a performing artist than I was just a studio artist. Meaning like I didn't want to spend eight hours a day just in a studio working by right. myself. I'm much more extroverted. Uh -huh. I realized that all my favorite things I ever did had like a live audience. And I was like, I think I'm actually a performer. Yeah. And, uh, and then immediately this like inner voice, I call it the voice of giving up, was like, nobody cares about an almost 40 year old man trying to become a performing artist. And I was like, that's a legit. I have that, that same voice. That's a like, legit like, argument. I, that, that voice must come to all of us. Yeah, yeah, especially anything you're doing that you're like, I deeply want to do it. And it's like, who do you think you are? Right. And so thus began a conversation. I was like, well, how do I move past this argument? What are What is my counter argument? Because that's a strong argument. And I started identifying there was like three main arguments that kept coming up with this voice, which was, nothing's really gonna change. You just, you're, you're kind of where you're at and there's no really change. Um, I, this is what I say in this show is you suck and you're ugly, which means <laughs> like, <laughs> which means like, uh, it's a, a imposter syndrome. Like, yeah. uh, who do you think you are? You're not good enough. And actually there's something wrong with you that you can't change that's always gonna prevent you from getting there. Mm. And then the last one is like giving up is better than trying or dying is better than living is how I would say it. And so I, over a, a year and a half, I, I actually did a lot of reading and talking and I started developing my own practices to like, as I started pursuing becoming a performance artist, yeah. I started developing my own arguments to those and they worked. And then, you know, as, as an artist, you're always paying attention to the muse. And I just sensed the muse say, it's time to start talking about this stuff. Mm. And so my first time was in Nashville on a live podcast with an audience. And I just like, I had notes. I just yeah. like talked uh -huh. through notes and people stayed afterwards and they're like, that was so helpful for me. And then, so then I started developing it. I started doing, I did a few more times and then uh, I just done it at an arts conference in Idaho and artists really loved it. And then that was the day we found out that Anthony Bourdain killed himself. Mm. And Look, I don't want to be a chef. I'm not trying to be a chef, but Anthony Bourdain represented, I think, what a lot of us who are makers hope to have in our life, which is we're unabashedly ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're really good at something. And because we're good at something in ourselves, that leads us to success and fame and travel and all those, all yeah. those things. And what his suicide confronted in me was like, he didn't even want to be himself with all of that. What makes you think that getting all of that will fill the lack you feel now. And and in this parking lot in Boise, Idaho, I was like, okay, I have some stuff about this. I want to make something that can at least add to the conversation about why we shouldn't give up on ourselves. What is the journey we're on? How, like, in some ways, Say Yes is a church service about suicide mm -hmm. because I've never been to one. And I was like, if I was going to make a church service about suicide, it needed to be honest. It needed to involve humor. It needed to have some weirdness and art and singing and storytelling because to talk about such a, and I would say there's a spectrum of suicide. Like there is the all the way, like I don't want to be here anymore, but there is the like little ways you can kill your life while you're still alive. Mm. Like I have a relative who's watched five hours of TV every night for 30 years. And now he's in his late seventies and he's like, I wish I would have done this. I right. wish I would have done this. Yeah. Like he committed suicide on his dreams mm. because he was just like, I can't do yeah. it. I could never get because there. Because he was listening um, to that voice. Yeah. And so, uh, so I was like, how do you, like, I was like, how do you talk about this stuff? Like, I'm not a therapist, but I go right. to therapy, uh -huh. you know, and I have yeah. a lot of psychologists come to my shows and like, this is great. This is really good group therapy, but I don't talk like a clinician. I talk like an artist. I right. talk like a, per, you know, performer. Uh -huh. And, um, and I've, I've seen that it, the fruit that it's been really helpful. So I was just like, how far do you, like, it just, I don't have like an end goal in mind. I think I just go, let's see how far this can yeah. go. Yeah. And so currently I'm translating into a book and then, um, you know, we're on pause because of COVID. So mm -hmm. we're not really doing performances. So now I'm reframing some things. I might change some things up because I got pretty set after a yeah, year and a half, yeah. but we'll see. So that, I think it's an important conversation because I think there are faith communities that are engaging in mental health, which is good. Um, I think suicide is particularly frightening to religion. Yeah. 
because a lot of religion works a, a, based on a product narrative, which is if you get God, it'll fill this lack. Like commercials are like, you have this problem. Your dishes aren't getting We're clean. Gonna solve it. But if you get this thing and put it in your dishwasher, yeah. it'll clean it. And uh -huh. kind of the same way as like, you have this hole in your heart and you keep trying to put all these other things, but what you need is God. And when you put it in, you'll all get clean. But that's not really how our lives work. Because then someone still feels those same feelings. Yes, exactly. Because when the product doesn't work, yeah. then you get rid of it. Mm. And what happens when your dreams die do you go, well, God let my dreams die. God let me get to this spot where my life, I followed God my whole life. How am I here? Mm -hmm. And my premise to the show is, well, maybe the giver of your existence is the one that led you to this place. Maybe the dream needed to die because there's a deeper desire in you. And there's actually this long tradition in the Christian tradition, St. Ignatius talks about it a lot, whereas there's this path of desire. And he says, actually, the way that God talks about uh, our calling, our vocation, our identity in our lives is through our desires. Now, desire is a sexy word and it can lead to destruction, right. but it also leads to flourishing. Yeah. So that takes discernment. Mm -hmm. And there is this process of discerning that. Yeah. But I found that a lot of... Um, people who've been a part of a religious tradition, that there, there have been some bad side effects, which has been people are afraid of their desires. They were told that they, they were, told were they evil, were bad. bad, your yeah. heart's bad. And so they've deferred their desire. Mm. And deferred desire leads only to bitterness. Mm. It leads you to become a bitter, judgmental, Mm -hmm. snarky person who's not fun at cocktail parties. <laughs> Who doesn't, you don't want to hang around them. <laughs> you don't want to hang out so with So even people. as you found, yeah. found yourself crying on your bathroom floor for yeah. 40 minutes, realizing this, I didn't know that it was going to, or, you know, you talked about the last 20 years, didn't look like that your life looks now. Yeah. But you said sometimes those have to die mm -hmm. for a good thing. Yeah. And that's what's hard to think. Because you think like, oh, this dream is dying. There must be something wrong with me. Yeah. But really it could lead to something but deeper the, conversation, yeah. more of your... The dream that needed to die was, well, if I was 18 and I knew this, then I would be where I wanted you to be now. You gotta let that go. And then the real question was like, well, why can't you start now? Now. And, the, and honestly, the answer was like, because it's embarrassing as a, as a 40 year old man to try to do something new. Yeah. Like I think there's this cultural expectation that by now you should have your stuff together. Right. Like, People my age make full length feature films, movies, you know, they play in orchestras. Uh -huh. They put like Lin-Manuel Miranda is younger <laughs> than me, you know, and like, I'm gonna start right. now. Like mm -hmm. I'd like to do performance yeah. art. It, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I think there's this kind of like, it's gonna be embarrassing to start from the beginning, which is where you have to, where everybody No starts. matter if you're 40 or 18. Yes, but there's a lot of assumptions in that argument that are false. Like that one of them is that nobody's interested in seeing somebody try. In fact, everybody's interested. One of my favorite designers, Steven Sagmeister, he says, anybody trying to do something honest is interesting. And so like, uh, and then, and then like everything has been said before, but the way that truth comes through your right. incarnation mm -hmm. has never been seen before. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that's what I found to be true. I had to trust that invitation to do that. Yeah. I love that. And I'm glad that you did. And I think this is so encouraging. I'm encouraged right here listening about the things that I have dreams that I want to start, but thinking yeah. who does that at 42? You're doing it. Here, we're doing it. <laughs> we're living in your dream. We're in the Jamie Ivey show I'm in a Jamie right Ivey dream right, right now. now. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. We've been married for almost two decades, and most of what we thought about marriage before getting married turned out to be wrong. It's better than we thought. But it's harder than we thought. We love deeper than we ever thought possible. And we have to work harder than we ever thought we would have to. And so we want to help you fight for your marriage and believe in it more than you even think it's possible. We wrote this book, Compliment, for all of you. Those of you that are engaged with Marriage on the Horizon, we believe this book has something for you. Those of you in the early years of marriage, still trying to figure things out, there's something in here for you too. Or maybe like us, you've got a few years of marriage under your belt, but maybe things seem a bit stale in your marriage and friendship. We hope that this book will be a catalyst to remind you of the beauty available to you within marriage. 
So we want to be super clear, we are not experts on marriage and we don't have a perfect one, but we do believe in it and we believe in your marriage. Compliment is two books in one written by both of us. I wrote a section. And I wrote a section. We each wrote on the same 10 topics, things like loving, fighting, forgiving, sex, parenting, and mission. And we didn't even read each other's sections beforehand, and together, our two parts make up one book. Compliment is full of stories and encouragement about how to choose together over separate in marriage, how to bring out the best in the other person, complimenting each other day after day, year after year. And we truly believe that when you do that, that God is glorified and that your marriage becomes stronger and more unified, more like how God intended it to be. All right, welcome back. Scott Erickson is still here with us. And Scott, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. You talked last time about how this spectrum of people at your shows who maybe have a dream that's yeah. dying. And I have seen you talk about how people who were contemplating actual suicide mm -hmm. and your show gave them hope and um, they walked through that. I, I'm so intrigued because I have never struggled with mental illness. I have people very dear to me that have. And so I, I, I have a small understanding of it from loving them. But your show seems to hit a wide variety of people struggling. Yeah. How is that even possible that the same people who have a dream that they feel yeah. is lost and the people who feel like all hope is lost? Yeah, it's been bizarre because sometimes when everybody loves something, you're like, is it good? Right. Because <laughs> I have high school students who will come and then I'll have retirees come. Uh -huh. And everybody in between is like, that hit me where I'm at, which was like quizzical at the time. I was like, OK, but it seems that probably during different stages of our lives, we have a very similar conversation. It might take different form, might be different scenarios, but it's a, a similar conversation, which is I'm being invited to show up as myself. I'm being invited to say yes to this mir miraculous life I've been given, whether I want to or not. Like that's the question. I think the real question as like a person who does deal with mental health stuff, the way that I would describe the conversation of suicide is like, yes, God, I know life is a miracle, but I don't want this miracle today. Mm -hmm. And that's a real tricky conversation. Yeah. Um, I would say that like, and I know it's it, it can be really hard to just discuss suicide but, but suicide, but I would say that what's attractive about suicide is that suicide is a plan. Suicide is like going, I'm going to, I'm going to make a future plan mm -hmm. to do something. I'm gonna organize myself. I'm going to escape my situation which all of those things can happen without having to take your own life. You're almost like, having them do a different organization yeah, plan. Like what you're saying is you're like, this isn't working any mm. longer and I wanna get out of it. And there's a part of us, it could be evil, it could just be neurology, I don't know. Ask somebody who's a professional. <laughs> <laughs> like there's a part of us that's just like the easiest way out would be to escape completely. Right. And, and that is, true, except there's massive damage on the other side of that that you haven't considered. But I would say what we can do is take this momentum of wanting to change though and apply it to the things we really hope for mm -hmm. in our lives. Like I would say that the dream is dying, but why that's so painful is because there's this deep desire still there. Mm. If the dream wasn't rooted to that desire, then it wouldn't matter it if wouldn't it didn't. Care. But what you're touching on is that you have this deep desire to live. You have this deep desire to life and thinking of not being able to do that is, is very painful. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I want to lead people in that honest uh, conversation. That's what I try to do and share my own story of mm -hmm. like, here's how I did it, but get to some like I take a lot of different things that are going on and then lead people into a spiritual practice from that. I actually think that mental health practices and spiritual practices are kind of the same thing. Yeah. So each argument, I give a counter argument and then I give a practice of mm -hmm. something to say or something to do. And then that helps people kind of work through those hurdles yeah. and stuff, yeah. I started the show today with you asking you how it made you feel that I have your art in my house, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is just so very cool. It's kind of like on a different level, but when someone tells me they listen to my show, I'm like, oh, thank you. That yeah. means a lot. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if you planned on what you created with your shows and now this project that you're working on called Say Yes. I don't know if you ever planned at the beginning for it to help so many people in their journeys with mental health. Hmm. How does that make you feel when someone says to you, I came to one of your events, I, I read one of your books on liturgy, and it changed a part of my life that I didn't know if I could change. What does that do to you as a person? I think there's this like universal gratitude. Uh, like I make a lot of things in a room by myself, mm -hmm. you know? And when I see a book in somebody's hand or art on their walls or they message me, I'm just so like humble. I just say I'm humbled and honored. Like I just, I didn't, yeah. I'm trying to seek as honestly as I can uh, the transformation I'm desiring. And then I will go through that transformation first. And then my art, my writing, my performance comes from that. So it's really like what I understand about myself is that I'm asked to go on a transformational journey. And first then, almost. First. Yeah. And then when I've let it do that, then I can go, hey, I'll come back. Yeah. I'll become the guide then. I'll yeah. come back and come. I'll take you where I was willing to go. And um and I'm okay with that yeah. invitation. Like I've, I think a lot of my job is just listening. Mm -hmm. Like today I dropped my kids off from school and you know, by the time they <laughs> went to school and they come back, it's only a certain amount of time. But I got home and I was like, bye. And my wife's like, where are you going? I was like, I'm going on a prayer walk. And I just, cause I'm like, I need to go walk for a half hour yeah. because that's my, it's my job. Yeah. It's my vocation to be a listener, mm. to go, what do I need to hear or do? Okay. And then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. You create great art and you said earlier how it can point us to on the spiritual journey through art, yeah. um, which is can be a new concept for some people, not mm -hmm. understanding. Yeah. I have noticed though, um, life's been hard for a lot of people in the last year, two years, four years since we've this been hard. I feel like people are craving beauty. Mm. I feel like people are craving art. Do you find that to be true as well right now? Yeah. Why yeah. do you think that is? I don't have a quick answer for this. I, I'll tell you <laughs> like why I think legit, it is. Like, it, like I would have to go, why do we crave beauty? Uh, yeah, tell me, tell me what your answer is. I mean, is. I feel like it's something that can, it can kind of transcend the pain that you might be experiencing, the difficult. I mean, if we just look at 2020, you know, if we look back on the last yeah. year, it's yeah. been a difficult year for so many people. People lost their lives. Uh, people lost their jobs. Yeah. Uh, people became homeless. Yeah. Um, and then there is this medium that you create and so many other beautiful artists, not even just with art, but with other kinds of art, that it almost unifies people deeper than the struggles that we have individually. Yeah. That's what I think, yeah. but I don't paint things either. <laughs> I just make TV shows, you know? I mean, I think beauty is a, uh, is a doorway. It become it like opens up the doorway to the rapturous experience of being alive. Mm. Um, I think when we are negotiating these, this win or lo loss, this cost or gain, and we go, oh, we lost so much in 2020. We lost, we gained so much in 2019. Or, you know, I whatever. don't know, whatever. We're, but beauty sidesteps all of that and just goes, being alive is amazing mm -hmm. right now. Like, I, I, I think a lot about wonder. I, I write, I have a lot of, like, actually, wonder is one of the antidotes to, I would say, giving up. Mm -hmm. Because wonder removes, it's, it's the space that moves out of the narratives and it just lets you experience the wonder of being alive, the rapturous experience of being alive. And, and those, are the, those are the money moments of life. And like when we think back, it wasn't about, wasn't it so cool that we, I don't know. You think back to your wondrous moments, it wasn't about like how you got there. Or this. It's just about, I was there and I saw it. And like, I saw those stars. I saw, I saw that beautiful, like just, I saw an old woman make a joke to a newlywed couple taking <laughs> wedding photos. That floored me for a week because it was such a great human yeah. moment. And I was filled, I had a holy mo wondrous moment at Disneyland with the character sadness because the line was five rows deep and I watched person after person deal with sadness mm. and take a picture with sadness. Yeah. And it was holy and I, I was crying in line. I was like, what's happening right now? I'm crying in the happiest place on earth. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's those moments are the, are the, the gold of life. Mm. And I think beauty reminds us of those. Yeah. 
It's why they say you have to stop and smell the roses. I know that's a cheesy saying, but it's because if we don't It's why stop, it's been around forever. Yes, yeah. if we don't stop in those moments, they literally can just pass us by yeah. and yeah. we will not even know what we missed. Yeah. Um, and so, Scott, thank you so much. Thank you it's for thanks for what you do in the world and the church and your art. And yeah. um, the Ivies are a fan, so thank you so much. Guys, thank you for joining us today for another episode of The Jamie Ivy Show. Okay, you're still here. We already finished the show, but you're still here. And I'm so glad you're here because I need to tell you something. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. While you're at it, like it. And then while you're at it, tell your friends. We have so many good shows coming up. So come on, subscribe, do all the things.